Hello, everyone, and welcome to a webinar discussion covering how to get your business ahead with the Venturi Style Steam Traps. Um, I'm James with Peerless, and I'd like to thank everyone for being here for today's session. The industry contributors we have for today's talk come from across the globe, uh, starting with Brian Anderson coming to us from South Africa. He's the founder and current director of Delta Steam Systems. Over the 23 years, they've been persistently ushering in progressive changes in process component technologies. He will be providing a comprehensive technical edge to the specifics of this conversation. Also joining us is Michelle Hood, a papermaking technology manager at Kruger Products in Canada, where he's both engineered and managed projects in production improvements and maintenance. For our discussion today, he will be bringing to the table a first-hand perspective of steam trap usage in the field. Our last participant is coming from here in the U.S. and is David McKendry the current president of Peerless Inc., who has led the company over the past 14 years and has an experienced history in the mechanical and industrial engineering space. He'll be the moderator, uh, moderator of this session, bridging the gap between theory and practice. My name is James, and I'll be behind the scenes keeping an eye on the questions and chat pane that you see in the control panel during this webinar. Uh, if there's anything that gets discussed that you'd like a deeper explanation of or have a question on, please send in your thoughts there. We will address those questions to our presenters during today's session. So feel free to ask away. I will now hand it over to Dave to kick things off. All right, thank you, James. Thanks for the intro and thanks for everybody in attendance today. As James mentioned, I've been leading our organization for just over 14 years and I've also been in the industry for 25 plus. And with that in mind, I can honestly say that the impact of the technology we're going to discuss today stands really alone as one of the simplest, simplest solutions I've come across that has the potential to not only improve safety for your team members, but also create significant measurable year over year cost savings for, for decades to come. So what we're going to discuss and I mentioned this to the folks uh, amongst us today as our organizers go. We're not professional presenters. We don't do this on a circuit, so please bear with us if uh, somehow, some way we have a hiccup. But the content here, I think, is going to be really valuable from everyone that uh, comes to us with a technical background as well as uh, interest in the product category commercially. So sort of a holistic overview of Venturi technology, steam track technology. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the testing methods and surveys, uh, common types of traps that most people are familiar with in the industry today and uh, how they operate and how they fail. Uh, get into how a Venturi steam trap differs and how it works. A little bit of uh, information about the way those types of traps are sized ways to defray costs if you ever do decide to move forward with a full plant uh, overhaul of your trap population and then finally michelle is here as a customer of a venturi trap uh, changeover and someone that's got a really great story to tell in terms of going from where they started to where they are today based on adopting venturi so moving forward i guess you know, it's kind of starting with Brian. Um, let's start with you. So in a moment, we'll ask you to go over the various types of traps, mechanical traps and, and the way that they fail. Uh, but before we get into that, I think it's important that we understand sort of what's really kind of a prerequisite to making an improvement to your traps in general. And it has a lot to do with testing. So Brian, would you mind kind of getting into sort of the way traps are tested and maybe the good better best kind of mindset what's the, the best way to do that yeah thanks dave all right so for steam trap testing which is quite important to know what's going on in your plant and the condition of your steam traps there's four main ways of testing the steam trap um, you get visual inspection uh, if a steam trap is discharging to atmosphere and you can see the outlet of the trap. Um, it's quite a good method to determine whether obviously a trap is failed, closed, which is blocked. You can see nothing's coming out. Um, or it can show leaking traps that are fully open. You can see it blowing. But it's difficult to identify whether it's a small or medium-sized leak. So visual inspection is a starting point. After that, you can test using temperature method. 
uh, infrared or thermal imaging or touch type probes. Uh, temperature method works well to find block traps again, cold traps, it picks it up quite quickly. Um, but on a, on a leaking trap, it's difficult to determine the size of a leak with the temperature method. Um, and it really should only be used in conjunction with ultrasonic testing methods uh, or equipment. Um, which brings us on to ultrasonic testing. Uh, testing a seam trap ultrasonically is an excellent testing method. Um, it can pick up small to large leaks. It can tell whether the trap's failed closed, failed open, and if it's failed open, how much steam is passing through it. Um, but without this matching software, it can't calculate the accurate financial losses of a, of a steam trap, which brings us to the software-based ultrasonic testing method. And that really is probably the, the cream of the crop of testing methods. It can pick up small to large leaks, and the matching software can reliably calculate the steam losses in pounds per hour and in dollar value. And uh, it gives unmatched results compared to any other testing method. So a survey here, this is an example, a demo survey that kind of is the, I would say the cream of the crop, correct? So can you just sort of explain, I know the details are difficult potentially to see on your screen, but uh, included in your side panels, uh, attendees, you should find a, a series of handouts. In there, you'll actually find this example steam trap survey that you can review uh, afterwards. But Brian, if you wouldn't mind kind of just summarizing what we're seeing here. Sure. So, yeah, this is a survey list of uh, ultrasonic steam trap survey that's been performed with the matching software. And the results that, that it puts out, you'll see the different color shades of red, the darker the red, uh, the, the more the trap's leaking. Um, if we had to look at the second steam trap on the line that's, that's orange, basically it gives the event name, the area, the trap number, location. And then importantly, it gives the type of steam trap, which is a float trap, um, the model, the name, the manufacturer. And then you, input is the, the inlet pressure of, at the trap, the size of the trap. And then further down the column, you'll see the vibration value. That's the reading taken off the ultrasonic tester. Once that information is put into the uh, software, It'll kick out whether it's leaking or not, whether it's, if it's not leaking, it's good. And then you carry on to the next one. If it's a leak, it tells you that it's leaking. It'll tell you how many pounds per hour it's leaking. Um, and then using a steam cost in this example, we've used a steam cost of, of $10 per ton. It'll tell you that that specific steam trap is leaking $1,489 uh, per year worth of steam. Uh, and that's on a plant operating 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And then on the last column, it gives a, a CO2 emission um, forecast on what that trap, the leaking steam is costing or is, is emitting uh, in CO2 emissions. And this is done for every trap on the plant. And uh, it, it generates a nice report and it gives you an accurate result of exactly how much steam is being lost in pounds per hour and dollars per year in your plant. So the data is important. And so Michelle, welcome. So from South Africa all the way up to Quebec, um, how important would you say the trap testing was to your team when you decided to make the uh, attempt at a, a trap upgrade? The information provided was invaluable. I mean, uh, essentially it, it gives us how much, uh, what the saving, uh, initial saving of the replacement will be, right? So, so that that information is to, is key to to developing a project to to do a full full plant uh, swap over. And so, for some of the people that are, you know might consider this, was the testing something that you were doing in house? Did you go outside for a service? How did you end up initially getting uh, a survey completed at at your facility? Uh, well, we had a we were approached by a vendor. Uh, through through another project we uh, another project we had done with that particular vendor, uh, and so he 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 provided a uh, a survey an initial survey, which identified some some pretty important savings uh, for our mill. So uh, the opportunity to potentially use uh, someone that provides the equipment, uh, traps, otherwise boilers, that sort of thing, as well as third party 
uh, services that are out there. And if uh, and if you can, in a perfect world, find someone that brings the survey data to you uh, as part of a, an approach to uh, giving you what you need as a baseline. So there's options for sure uh, with testing, but no matter what, I think it's really important to, to look at that as a starting point, no matter what trap type you're using, knowing that information is really valuable. So when we talk about the types of traps that most people are familiar with, Brian, if you wouldn't mind just kind of going through the various trap types uh, that are out there and a little bit about, you know, their failure modes, as well as uh, some routine maintenance that might be required. Okay. So on the slide in front of you, you've got the four main types of steam traps. And I'll start at the beginning with the thermodynamic trap. It's probably the most common trap used in a plant. It's used extensively on uh, steam line drip legs, uh, steam distribution systems to get the condensate out of the system. Um, and sometimes used on, on process equipment, but it's not really recommended for that. It's a very simple trap. It's got a disc at the top that moves up and down. And as it rises, it ejects the condensate. The disc falls back down onto the seat and uh, closes with steam. And that opens and closes continuously throughout the day um, and ejects as much condensate as possible. But the, the disc is moving up and down constantly on that seat and often results in wear and tear quite quickly. Uh, thermodynamic traps or TD traps are uh, notorious for, for failing op in the open position um, and uh, they when they leak they leak quite a bit of steam. The second most common trap is the float trap or F&T float and thermostatic. It's got a ball float in the inside and it rises and, and falls as the condensate fills the chamber. Um, it's also got a built-in air vent uh, that you can see discharges air and non-condensable gases. So it's two traps in one really. That uh, air vent is constantly opening, closing, and the ball and lever is constantly lifting up and down, working me mechanic. Um, over time, the thermostatic air vent will start to leak steam. Um, the ball is prone to damage by water hammer. Uh, the ball will fail normally in the closed position from water hammer. So if it's damaged, it sinks to the bottom. And uh, the air vent that's built into it will often fail in the open position. Uh, the next trap is, is a thermostatic or a bimetallic trap. It's got bimetallic strips that, that open and close as the temperature changes. It lifts a valve off a seat and allows the trap to discharge. Uh, again, it it's cycles over and over and it, it uh, works on a subcooled system. So the condensate upstream generally cools down to a, to a certain amount. So there is backing up of condensate with these kind of traps. And then the last one is an inverted bucket, which is a, uh, uh, this, the bucket inside the trap, you can see it's got a little hole at the top for an air vent. It cycles up and down as the condensate level in it rises and falls. It opens a valve and seat, the valve assembly uh, cycles open closed. And uh, there's two ways that it can stop working. That air vent, that little hole in the bucket, in the inverted bucket uh, can start to uh, block up from debris in the system and then it'll fail in the closed position or if the valve assembly gets uh, damaged uh, it'll start to leak steam. All these steam traps work constantly opening and closing hundreds of times an hour, thousands of times a day, millions of times a year and uh, that working up and down opening closing results in the traps eventually wearing out and parts starting to leak or failed open or failed in the closed position. So it, with that in mind, you know, there's a fair amount of routine maintenance with all these moving parts. And the, a quick poll we're going to throw up here has to do with uh, maintenance. So I believe everyone should be able to see the poll at this point. If you take a moment, does your facility have a preventive and maintenance program for steam traps? Some of the attendees today are uh, mechanical contractors, so they most likely don't have one, but maybe they participate in one. Um, for their customers and then those of you who have facilities if you're familiar so uh, whether or not you have a preventative maintenance program is obviously an important thing so from that information um, only a quarter of you said that you had a preventative maintenance plan in place uh, just about 44 percent said no they do not and 33 percent said they're not sure so 
something that really is truly that vital in order to make sure that those steam losses we talked about during the survey aren't occurring would be a preventative maintenance plan. So, you know, in looking at the preventative maintenance, uh, Michelle, before going to Venturi style traps several years ago, what would you have said the correlation between your plant's energy consumption and steam trap maintenance would have been? So how good or bad was your trap maintenance program and how did that affect where you are were at the time? Uh, so, yeah, we didn't have a, uh, at least we didn't have any preventive uh, preventive maintenance uh, program. So I would assume that our, our, our efficiency wasn't very, but wasn't as high as it could have been had we had a, a more prevent, uh, yeah, having a, a preventive, a preventive uh, maintenance uh, program in place. So, and then thinking about that, now under the current situation using Venturi's, how good or bad would you say your preventative maintenance? So maybe that's loaded. Do you have or don't you have a, a preventative maintenance program? Right? right. So, so not having a strong maintenance program before the change. Uh, well, we we didn't see it uh, until we got the uh, survey done over the uh, over the over our system. So we found that like 23% of our traps had failed open or partially opened. So I mean that's his, a large portion of our traps steam or venting at live steam into our our, our condensate system. Um, and and now our our we still don't have a preventive uh, uh, preventive maintenance, uh, but it, but it's not required with, with our venturies. And that, and then just sort of kind of like tipping our hats in some respects, but saying, you know, one thing we hear a lot is uh, uh, repair parts that people have on hand inventories. So how significant would you say your repair part inventory is for your current trap? It, it's it's negligible. It's, okay. it's very low. So, you know, thinking in terms about understanding the losses, making sure you're either taking care of your system and, and not losing that steam and that, that value, um, what would maybe work better than what is typical, which is what we're looking at here. So, Brian, Venturi traps, um, can you give us an explanation of how these devices operate, how they compare to mechanical steam traps in terms of longevity? But maybe even before that, um, we want to take a little bit of a look at what the misnomer is between an orifice trap, let's say, and a venturi trap. Okay, this is just catching back up on, on failed steam traps. Uh, it's showing a thermodynamic or a TD trap failed open. And it's doing what we call motorboating. It's, it's, it's just blowing steam. So that's what it looks like when a, a thermodynamic trap fails open on the left. And then on the right is an example of a floating thermostatic trap, F and T, that's had water hammer, which has damaged the ball float. That float on the right is, is meant to be round. Um, it's been banged in by the water hammer, and that trap will fail straight away in, in, in normally the closed position from that. And you won't get temperature at your at your process application. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yep, yep. I skipped the slide there. I appreciate it. So the next one we wanted to take a look at in terms of Venturi's though was moving ahead. There's a lot of people out there that think of Venturi traps and orifice traps as sort of one and the same. So this was the slide that I yeah. was so eager to show a moment ago. Uh, so yeah. Brian. So the, the the picture on the left is showing what's a, a simple orifice trap. Uh, it's just a, a plate with an orifice in it sized for an, uh, an application and these kind of steam traps that you don't find them often but they are used in some applications but it has to be where there's a constant condensate load so where there's no change in in load where it's not your load's not rising and falling where it's constant pressure's pretty constant then you can use a, a simple plate orifice but the the downside to it is that orifice is quite thin through the plate and uh, over time it starts to wire draw and wear and it will enlarge and start to leak steam. So that's a, a simple orifice trap uh, of sorts that, that, that used to be used many years ago. 
But the Venturi style trap, as you can see on the picture on the right, um, the, the Venturi that does the work is in the top chamber of the trap, um, the nozzle. And so inlet, is, it comes up through a strainer up into the, the top port through a secondary strainer. And there's two strainers in, in, in this model trap, which is to keep it from blocking. Um, then it's got an inlet with an elongated tunnel orifice. And that tunnel orifice is there so that it can't, not, not like the orifice plate traps, um, that is very thin and, and wide and wire draw over time and wide. And that long orifice allows it not to widen and leak steam. And then it goes out through the venturi and out the trap. Um, and, so and that's Brian, the big difference between those two. This, this would be a good point to probably show the quick overview video. Does that seem right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. At startup, the water is at very low pressure and temperature, so no flashing occurs as it exits the venturi. This means there is no back pressure present to restrict the flow of cold condensate as it exits the delta trap. This cold water exits freely at two to three times faster than hot pressurized condensate can at running load. This absence of flash steam on startup is why delta venturi orifice steam traps are suitable for startup loads. Once all the cold condensate and non-condensable gases have been ejected, steam and hot condensate reach the delta steam trap. As the steam continuously condenses to hot condensate in the pressurized steam system, it is fed to the steam trap by the pressure in the system. This hot condensate passes through the orifice and enters the mouth of the venturi. As the condensate passes through the mouth of the venturi, there is a sudden pressure drop which causes a percentage of the hot condensate to change phase from condensate to steam, a phenomenon known as flashing. This flashing creates a back pressure zone in the mouth of the venturi. Because condensate is 1,000 times denser than steam, it is able to push through this back pressure zone while restricting the steam. As the pressure and load in the steam system vary, so too does the percentage of flash steam being created at the mouth of the venturi in the delta steam trap, which in turn allows the back pressure at the venturi to vary accordingly. This varying of back pressure at the mouth of the venturi allows the delta steam trap to self-regulate the condensate flow as the condensate load changes. As the pressure or load in the steam system rises or falls, the back pressure that is constantly changing at the mouth of the venturi also rises or falls. This action gives the delta venturi orifice steam trap the ability to easily manage discharging varying condensate loads in a steam trap that has no moving parts, while still keeping the steam in the system. So Brian, the video, uh does a great job explaining anything else that you want to mention there regarding the process. Yeah, I think what's important to know is, is that a, a Venturi steam trap is able to handle varying loads. It's quite important on a steam system in a plant, your condensate load changes constantly and it's rising up and down uh, on, on distribution lines, on process applications like heat exchanges. And as your load changes, the trap, the Venturi trap must be able to to get rid of that condensate, keep the steam in the system as the load changes. And I think, uh, Michelle, that's something that, that you've experienced in your plant that doesn't have a fixed load, it has a varying load, and uh, the traps need to work accordingly. That's correct. So the one thing we do know about Benjiri traps, though, that, that is somewhat different than the typical mechanical technology is that in order for them to work properly, whether it's in a simple steam supply line or a complex variable load process application, we need to size them properly. So something we wanted to talk about, Brian, I guess if you could go over a couple of examples of uh, that a Venturi user would need to be comfortable providing, because sometimes we find that when we start getting into the detail of re requiring the data, it's when we start getting some resistance because people aren't used to having to uh, to provide that much information to be able to replace their traps. So um, I'm going to move on. This is just a couple of sample, uh, samples of sizing sheets. In your handouts also, you'll find that there's a, a variety of sizing sheets available. 
uh, one of the options of the five handouts. So, you know, feel free. But Brian, if you could elaborate a little bit more for us. Thank Great. You. So, with with sizing of any trap or, or supplying any steam trap, whether it be a venturi trap or a conventional mechanical type steam trap, it's just, it's important to know uh, the differential pressure, the steam pressure, and then the condensate load that the trap needs to discharge. So that's for any trap, but often this isn't known, um, and normally the customer will just say it's a it's a one inch pipe on a 60 psi system, so just supplies the trap for that, and uh, eight, nine times out of 10, that mechanical type trap will work for that application. Um, but again, over time it fails and needs to be replaced. With the Venturi trap, um, for drip leg steam distribution lines, the sizing information is quite simple. We need a, a, a bit of information, the steam pressure, the size of the steam pipe that's been trapped, the length of the steam pipe that's been trapped, and then whether it's an insulated or uninsulated steam line. And uh, that's normally enough information to size a, a steam distribution line or a drip leg on the left. Um, on the right is an example of a, a shell and tube heat exchanger and, and the information required there is a, is a bit more. So uh, it's what size the, the distribution, the supply line is, steam pressure, whether it has a control valve or not. Um, and then we, we, we need to know a bit about the, the actual application. Um, so we need to know what's been heated, um, from what temperature to what temperature, uh, how quickly it's been heated. Um, and uh, we'll size the, the Venturi nozzle based on this information from the customer. Um, not always does the customer know that information. So sometimes it's, it's not possible to get that. And then it is possible to size just based on steam supply line and differential pressure only. But we advise that if that's done, then uh, it's, it's important to check the trap afterwards, whether it's slightly oversized. If, if the orifice is slightly oversized and it leaks steam, then obviously um, we'll need to replace the, the orifice with a smaller nozzle. You can see in the, in the screen in front of you, it's an example of, of the DSV model trap. And uh, it, if the nozzle is oversized or undersized, it's simply a matter of, of changing that Venturi nozzle that's, that's in the middle of the picture there. Um, opening the top cap, unscrewing the nozzle, uh, screwing the new one in, and closing the cap again and putting it back into commission. It's a five-minute uh, exercise and it, it's done quite quickly. So if, if sizing is, is slightly out uh, or if, if incorrect information has been received um, regarding the sizing and we've, we've, we've sized based on that and then find out later the pressure is different or the load is different, uh, then it's just a simple exercise of replacing the nozzle. Michelle, do you recall you, I think when we talked, you said it was over 200 traps that you replaced at the time. Do you have a recollection of what percentage of the traps after initial installation needed to be essentially retrofitted with a different venturi? Uh, it was below 5%. So the, the, the work put into actually finding all that information was worth it because there was very little traps that we had to go back and actually change the venturi nozzle. So at the end of the day, Brian, you don't need to tear the trap out, right? That's the key is that once once the trap has been put in, even if in the case that something has occurred that, you know, is uh, causing us some problems, it's a matter of isolating the trap and just uh, removing that singular part. So I think that's also something we hear uh, the current concerns about those traps. So um real quick here let's see if we can advance the slide one moment for me all right so michelle when you did your homework back in the day you had a pretty significant amount of research put into you know sort of looking for partners um after everything was said and done, you know, what were some of the the criteria you used to select a partner for your upgrade? And anything you'd recommend to any of the attendees in terms of what to look out for uh, when comparing? Right. So my analysis found that, in essence, 
the the base technology so so the the actual venturi uh you know that the technology was was uh, was the same for for all the different vendors so as far as you select one one uh one venturi versus the other they all seem to be uh working similarly um what the I guess the big difference is 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 and I hate to say it that way, but it's the bells and whistles, right? So so like delta straps have you know the double strainer uh, and and the removable the you know the removable uh, venturi and it's those kinds of of uh, options that really make the difference I think in in, in the end run. But as far as as technology wise, I think they're they're def they were definitely all equivalents the one that we that uh, we evaluated and it, there's no doubt that you know we organizationally brian and i would say oh isn't delta the greatest but it's true that the venturi itself uh, a variety of technology or a variety of providers can can get you to a similar place uh so just some of the differences there are, are good to hear about when, when we get to the point of understanding the impact of what the change from uh, a more typical mechanical to a venturi style would be you know there's there's people that you know we can give some examples but brian if you wouldn't mind elaborating a little bit about a study that uh you, know, you were a part of a while back yeah sure so we we worked with uh, uh, quite a large international petrochemical company and uh, they'd been using thermodynamic traps for many years and they were finding it's a, on an especially harsh application um, they were finding the, the, the disc type thermodynamic traps were failing within a few weeks, two to four weeks is what they originally said. And it was continuous. Um, they kept replacing the traps and especially in this application, uh, they were failing regularly. So after a while, they decided to, to test uh, free float ball, ball type traps. Um, that's a, a ball float trap with no arm with a ball that, that floats freely in the cylinder. And they got a much better result out of it. Uh, I think it was seven months that they said they lasted, uh, which was hugely beneficial to them. Um, and then we had approached them through our agent and uh, introduced the technology to them. And they, they tested the traps and uh, they tested a number of them. And on that application, after a year, they pulled the traps out of service to inspect them. And uh, they were in exactly the same condition that they were supplied. There was no wire draw. There was no widening of the orifice. The traps weren't leaking steam and they were working perfectly. Um, and they put them back into service. And uh, yeah, they, 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 uh, the recommendation was to move forward with retrofitting the, the plant with Venturi traps. So it's always good to hear from someone that has done their own homework, done the research and without Know, saying who it's it's someone that you you know everyone would respect as being technically very capable who did this research on their own so uh, as michelle said i'm sure other venturi types might have worked uh, brian was the one to introduce it uh, but what a great opportunity for this facility to be able to help reduce the total cost uh, in a facility um, and, and, and as it turns out other facilities like it as part of that company's total plant population. So one other thing quickly as we're winding down here, just about to finish up, the um, the, the idea of, of trying something like Venturi's is certainly very common amongst people in the engineering and maintenance environment. When we look at trying to have the impact, uh, similar to what we just saw in the data that Brian shared, you know, it really takes, replacing all the traps and that's a pretty big undertaking so something that you know we've been seeing more and more of is, is virtually every uh township whether uh in in canada or north america in general you're going to find that there's opportunities for uh funding incentives from from agencies and, and energy concerns uh, that was the case with michelle michelle would you mind sort of describing the program your facility leveraged Right. So, with partner with uh, Hydro Quebec and the the Quebec government, they managed to uh, uh, subsidize a portion of the project to uh, to bring the ROI to within a year. Right. So, so so it it helps with putting the projects into our system, uh, you know, to to management and making the uh, 
approval a lot easier, right? In, in the beginning, we had this discussion too, the idea that your trap maintenance program wasn't really uh, your forte and that the failure rate was relatively high when you got the data. The payback window was pretty quick based on that. And not every facility has that situation, but once everything was said and done, um, it's been how many years since the install? So we completed the installation at the end of 2015. And then the ROI was there and then. That's right. And also the, the, the uh, government uh, asked us to uh, provide a three year uh, follow up to make sure that, you know, the system was still up and running in program. And, and so we, we maintained our, our, what we said we were going to save as far as, as, any, as uh, steam consumption uh, throughout those three years. And, uh, you know, we, we do one regular uh, verification every time we start up the system uh, where we do a temperature verification that all the traps are running okay. And uh, that's that's pretty much all we do as far as uh, as far as maintenance. Every now and again, we do get one or two that are blocked. Uh, but again, those, those we clean out the screens, uh, clean out the orifice, and then we put it back in service. And that's that's the end of it. And when we first talked, the, uh, it was interesting kind of when we discussed the fact that you hadn't even had much thought about the program in a couple of years, just because the sort of set it and forget it mindset was was actually not a bad thing to do. That uh, the meter has been running all these years in terms of the savings that, that you've incurred based on a not uh, losing the energy based on steam loss and, and be the fact that your maintenance team isn't spending their time maintaining the system so it does not lose steam. So just really, I think for both of us, a good opportunity to just say, hey, this is something that doesn't just provide a short-term solution that pays you back in a small window. It's It really is an annuity that keeps giving into the future. Um, Brian, finally, as we close out here, one of the things we've been discussing is some of the key people that need to be involved in something like this. Anything you can uh, provide us in terms of, you know, who should take a look at this sort of technology? Sure. Yeah, it, it varies plant for plant, but uh, normally you're coming in on an engineering level, which is quite important. But if you can get uh, buy-in from the finance and management at the same time, and then you can really kick it up a level and, and introduce and, and offer the technology across the board so that management, uh, finance and engineering are all on the same page. Um, it's quite a good step to take. And Michelle, in your case, by the title, who was your sort of champion in terms of empowering you to do what you ended up doing? Um, so yeah, we had a, a an energy coordinator within our within our company that was looking at all different uh, ways to be able to help reduce our, our energy consumption. So uh, essentially, the you know, the project uh, emerged through him, and then I was the one that actually just kind of uh, executed it, I guess. Well, and I, I think that's always the case. There's a, a significant technical. Uh, requirement in order to implement something like this and it's oftentimes the place that projects begin but without the support of someone on the other side uh, it could take decades to, to get through the replacements with your normal maintenance budget so more and more we're seeing the value of you know partnering internally with someone that's looking at the financial outcomes on a on a uh, on an annual basis uh, and can really empower people who understand this technology to to do a lot more a lot quicker. Um, so, all right, well, I think that does it. We uh, probably went a little bit longer than I thought. I appreciate it. There again, we have uh, the handouts include also a couple of case studies, including the Kruger case study, which is uh, what prompted our conversation here today with Michelle. I thank Michelle and Brian immensely for your time. If there are any questions um, and you want to submit those to the panel here as we're closing out, uh, feel free. And if also you want to just follow up directly with us, uh, you're welcome to do that as well. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back to James.
close things out. Sure, thanks. So uh, this concludes today's webinar session. We want to thank everyone involved and in attendance for participating in today's webinar. We hope this has been an informative and interesting discussion that's given you some more perspectives on steam traps in your facility and maybe revealed some potential options for your systems that you might not have considered. Uh, once again, thank you for attending this session and we hope that you have a great rest of your day.